Hello, and welcome to Lecture 6 of Motion in a Plane in Phys 1104. In this video lecture, we're going to do a few more details about friction, because as I'm sure you agree, we haven't discussed friction nearly enough yet. We've already seen that a static friction force behaves just like most other contact forces, in that its size adjusts to maintain the object, in this case, in a non-slipping state. So as you push harder and harder, the static friction increases its magnitude to maintain a vector sum of forces of zero so that the acceleration is zero. More generally, you could have, say, something on a conveyor belt that's accelerating, and then the static friction would be adjusting to be just the right size so that the object would accelerate along with the conveyor belt. So in general, the way we solve for the magnitude of a static friction force is to write down the equation of motion for the object and solve for the static friction force out of that. But you also know that if you push hard enough, eventually the surface essentially starts to break, and the two surfaces start skipping across each other. And there is a rough model that you can use to predict how hard you have to push before that happens. Now, to understand it, we need to think about the mechanism of friction again. Remember that the object sitting on the surface has an upward perpendicular force on it exerted by the surface. And if you change the orientation of the object, that force doesn't change. It's just distributed over a different surface area. Now, if you think about how, how hard you will have to push on these two objects to get them sliding, most people's intuition tells them that they would have to push harder on this one because of the larger surface area of contact. But in fact, experiment shows that that intuition is incorrect, and here's why. Remember the microscopic picture. On the microscopic scale, these two surfaces are in contact at only a small number of contact points. And so the force that's being exerted between them occurs at those contact points distributed across them. Now, when you turn the object so that it's in contact on this smaller surface, that means there are fewer contact points, and so the force at each contact point has to be larger. The result of that is that the contact points deform more, and so instead of small little contacts, you can end up with flattened out larger contacts, with larger forces occurring at each one. And so what that means is even though it seems like the area in contact is larger in this case, the actual effective surface area in contact is about the same in both. And as a result, the, the amount that you'll have to push, the size of the force you'll have to push to get this thing moving in the two cases turns out to be the same. The resulting maximum value of the static friction force ends up being proportional to the size of the perpendicular force being exerted by the same surface. And so you get it by what is called a coefficient of static friction, which is a property of the surfaces. So for example, it would be different for wood on wood versus steel on steel or steel on wood. And it, that is then a fraction of the perpendicular force exerted by the same surface. Note, I have not said that the static friction force is mu s times that perpendicular force. That is absolutely not what I've said. What I have said is that the maximum value of this frictional force is given by this. In general, it will be less than this, and you have to find it from the equation of motion. 
Let's work a quick example to see some of these ideas. So here's a block on a surface being pulled by a rope, and the rope is at an angle above the horizontal, and it is not accelerating. So the free body diagram would look like this. Here's this force of static friction, and I'm going to say we know the coefficient of static friction. Note, here's a table of coefficients of static friction. You can look these things up. Look, a lot of these are given to two significant figures. You know what? That's nonsense. Coefficients of friction are so unreliable, so complicated, that we never know them to two significant figures. They depend on things like humidity, how clean the surfaces are. They're so complicated they might depend on what day of the week it is and what the experimenter had for breakfast. So you cannot quote them to two sig figs, but they often are anyway. Anyway, let's figure out what the force of static friction is on this block right now. Go ahead, pause the video for a moment and calculate it. Okay, so if you're back, I hope you didn't do something like mu s m g. If you did that, wrong, 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 wrong. Because what we've just been talking about is that you get it out of the equation of motion. It is just big enough to maintain the acceleration of zero. So we need, we need a vector sum of forces of zero. So I am now going to write the equations of motion for this block. So I have written the equations of motion here, and here I have decomposed the force due to the rope. And notice, if we want to solve for that static friction, which is right here, it's the only unknown in this equation because we know this component of the force due to the rope. And so there we see that we just, as I explained, solve for the static friction out of the equation of motion. It ends up just being, its magnitude in this case, is equal to the x component of the force that the rope is exerting on the block, which is just 4.33 newtons. Suppose we wanted to know instead how hard we would have to pull on the rope to get this block sliding. Now we actually are asking how hard do we have to pull so that the friction ends up getting to its maximum value, because if we pull any harder than that, then the block will start sliding. And so the way to do that is to say, okay, let's let that static friction force be its maximum value, in which case that is equal to mu s times the perpendicular force that the surface is exerting. We could now put that into the equations of motion. I'm going to do that, and I'm going to substitute in for the components of this rope force. Except remember, we're finding how hard we have to pull, so it's no longer 5 newtons. Here are the equations of motion rewritten that way. Note I've put in the components of the force due to the rope in terms of its magnitude, which is actually what we want, so that's an unknown. That's one unknown. And I have put in that the static friction magnitude is its maximum value, and so it is this mu s times the perpendicular force. And one thing to notice is that as we pull harder on the rope, that perpendicular force decreases. So we do not know the strength of that perpendicular force. It's another unknown. But that's fine now. We have two equations in two unknowns. I'm going to leave it to you to solve it. I will take a brief pause, and I will show the answer that you should get when you solve it. So solving this pair of equations for the magnitude of the force by the rope, you should come up with something like this. And putting in the numbers, I got 8.96 newtons.
So here's a question for you to think about. If you're doing this through Moodle, it'll ask you this before you go on to the second part of this video lecture. If you're not on Moodle, then I think you should really answer this for yourself before going on. So here we have a block. It's sitting on a horizontal surface. We know the coefficient of static friction, and we know the inertia of the block. And a hand is pushing on the block with a force of 10 newtons. And we just want to know how big the static friction force is on this block. 